All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, all right, so last time we finished up by going through the RSA algorithm, at least. So this is for encryption. This is what you do. You have, you have to set up all these variables. And then you can encrypt your ciphertext by taking your message and raising it to your encryption key mod n. And then likewise, you can decrypt it um, by then raising the ciphertext to the decryption key that you chose uh, such. All right, so I, I have stated that this works. However, I haven't shown you that it works. Um, now, to really like understand the proof of why it works, you have to understand a bit of number theory. Uh, so we don't really want to go into that, but I, I will go into, I'll try and give you some insight and intuition as to why it works. Um, but to do that, before we, before we look at that, let's just go through an example so that you know how to apply uh, RSA. So let's say that Bob wants to send a message to, to Alice. And, or sorry, Alice wants to send a message to Bob. So she needs to know Bob's public key to send a message to him, right? All right, so let's say that Bob chooses uh, P is equal to five and Q is equal to seven. This is two primes. Now these are much smaller than you would use in practice. You would use uh, typically at least 512-bit uh, numbers for this. You wouldn't use these very small numbers, all right? So then we have, so we have that n is equal to p times q. So here we have 5 times 7, which is 35. So we have n equals 35. And we also have that z is equal to now 4 times 6. Twenty four. All right, and we need to choose E, so we need to choose our encryption key. And we have to choose E such that E is less than N, and the greatest common divisor of E and Z needs to be one. So we can pick any number that's relatively prime with twenty four. So let's just choose that e is equal to five. Okay, so here this is a choice that we make, so we choose this. All right, now we need to uh, find a d that matches this criteria. Um, so here let's choose that d is equal to 29. And this works because um, five times 29 minus one is divisible by 24, all right, which we need. Okay, so let's suppose that Alice wants to send um, just a short message to Bob, and just to make it, it easier to encode this message, let's say that A is equal to one, B is equal to two, C is equal to three, and so on, okay? So the letters are just equal to their position in the alphabet. All right, so let's look at how we would then encrypt the letter L. So we have an L, so M is equal to, let me not call it M, let's call it something like capital M. So our message is equal to the string L. All right, so then we have M, our numeric representation of our message is 12. All right, because L is the 12th letter in the alphabet. And now to encrypt this, we need to compute our message raised to E and mod it by M. So for that, we have M raised to the E, which in this case, E is uh, 5. So E is equal to 5. So M raised to 5 uh, ma is equal to a very large, well, it's not a very large, but a reasonably large number. It's 248832. And then so now to get the ciphertext, we need to take this by mod um, n, which n in our case is 35. Um, and this is equal to 17. 
Okay, so here we have that our ciphertext is equal to 17. Okay. Now on the other end, to decrypt it, so this was encryption. And now on the other side, we need to decrypt the message. And to do that, we just follow this step right here. So we take what we received. So we have the M is equal to our uh, 17. And we need to raise that to D, which in our case is 29. OK, so this is equal to a pretty large number. Um, I'm not going to write out the whole thing. It's 48, 19, and then it's quite long. You can plug it in a calculator if you don't trust me. Now, and then we need to mod this by n again, um, which n was 35 in our case. Um, 35. So now we apply that mod, and this is equal to 12, which we can now get the actual message out of that, which was the letter L. All right, so let's look at, you now why does RSA work? And so this is what we have here. When we encrypt something and then decrypt it, what we're doing is to encrypt it, we're applying Bob's public key. All right, so I'm going to draw the, or write this as a function. So we have that we're applying Bob's public key. And then to decrypt it, we apply his private key. All right. So if we, based on RSA, we have that this is equal to our message raised to the E, because that's what the encryption stage does. It raises it to E. And then we have all this raised to our decryption key, because that's what decryption does, right? And we still have this mod N. Now we need, we need to get manipulate this. And in order to do that, we're going to use a theorem for number theory. Uh, so this is just something I'm not going to prove this or anything. Um, but it's a statement that, or it's a theorem that you can look up if you're interested. So if P and Q are prime, and N is equal to P times Q, then we have that X raised to the Y power mod N is equal to x raised to y mod p minus 1 times q minus 1. So now that we have this theorem, we have a, uh, an equation that looks like this. So we can apply this theorem. And so we can now say that this is equal to m raised to e times d. Uh, so sorry, I'm just going to make one quick optimization is move this d down to there. Okay. So that's why we have e times d here. And we need to, based on the theorem, we need to mod this by p minus 1 times q minus 1. And then again, here we have the whole thing is still mod n. So I'm running into my part. Okay, and then this is equal to, all right, so let's think about it here. We defined, what do we define e times d to be? So we have here the e times d minus 1 is equivalent to 0 mod z. All right, and what was z equal to? Was z is equal to p minus 1 times q minus 1. So we're doing the same thing here. We just don't have that minus 1 here. But we can move equivalently here. We could say that this is equal to e d 
is equivalent to 1 mod z. So we know that this exponent is equal to 1. So we have m to the 1 mod n. And I'll just write why the, this, this is true so you have it in your notes. And this is because we have the e times d mod um, p minus 1 times q minus 1 is equal to 1. And that's just by definition. OK, well, if raising m, m to the 1 power is m, and then we define m such that it's, I didn't write it down, but we defined last time m such that it's less than n. So then we have this is equal to n. And this is since m is less than n. OK, so the security of RSA, therefore, based on this, you can see that if you can get P and Q, if you can factor N into P and Q, then you can break RSA. All right? So therefore, RSA is only as hard as factoring an integer. And in its security relies on the fact that factoring seems to be a hard problem. OK, so RS, breaking RSA is as hard as factoring an integer. Now, a lot of people have worked on finding fast factoring algorithms. And so far, no one has been able to find a polynomial time algorithm for factoring. Meaning that the best fa factoring algorithms we have right now are, are super polynomial, which is what we want, right? So this means that we can encrypt and decrypt a message in a short amount of time, a polynomial amount of time. However, if we don't know the secret keys, Breaking it requires an exponential amount of time. At least we think so. So one, one wrinkle is, uh, you know, this is, it's, uh, I guess, just in theory right now, is that if we had quantum computers, they can actually factor um, integers very quickly. So they do have a polynomial time algorithm for factoring on quantum computers. All right, so now quantum computers are just in study right now. They're, they don't, you know, there's no one's actually building and shipping a quantum computer that you can go out and buy or even in research labs or anything. Um, but if, if we are able to make this type of computing work, then it means that we'll have to find a different way to do encryption. Okay. Okay, so let me just do... One more thing here is that in practice, we actually don't use RSA for all communication. And the reason why is that RSA is, is very, I mean, not very, but it's computationally expensive. And the reason it's expensive is because we have this number that we have to take to a pretty large exponent, right? So here in the decryption stage, we have whatever the ciphertext is, and then we have to raise it. In this case, we just raised it to 29, but in practice, your numbers will be much larger. You have to raise it to like a 512-bit number. And that's, that's pretty slow, actually. That's pretty computationally expensive. Uh, whereas last time we talked about the data encryption standard, which if you remember, is a secret key cryptography scheme, it's much, much faster. It's much easier to implement in software, or you can even implement it in hardware. And because of this, we typically use RSA to exchange private keys. So we use RSA to exchange the keys, then we switch to DES. When you switch to DES, you, you have to, both parties have to have the same key. They have to have the same private key for DES to work. All right. So you exchange this private key. You both know it. But you, don't, you, you typically only use this as temporarily. 
So say you're like connecting to Amazon.com or whatever, you're going to buy something. Your browser would do RSA, get, and you'd set up a private key pair with, with uh, Amazon servers. And this would just be randomly generated at the time. And then you'd use it for that session and then discard it. So is there a, a correlation between computational time? I mean, so there is a, a correlation between the amount of computation it takes to break some code, some encoding, all right? You want it to be very long. Um, and the reason is just to make it harder. I mean, any, any encryption can be broken given enough time, but you want to make it take, you know, like thousands of years for the attacker, for instance. All right, so let's move on to uh, message integrity. And I'll just define the problem and then we'll take a break. The, the idea behind message integrity is that we want to make sure that the message is actually from who it's supposed to be from and that the message wasn't tampered with. So let me just write this down. So to authenticate a message, Bob needs to he must verify that the following two things hold. So first of all, we need to know that the message originated with Alice. All right, so we want to make sure that it actually did come from Alice. And then second, we want to make sure the message wasn't tampered with. So M was not tampered with in transit. So if a message has these two properties, then it's said to have integrity. All right, so if message M has these properties, it has integrity. Now that you know the definition of message, message integrity, let's look at different protocols that, that can provide this. And I guess before I do that, let me just give you an example of why message integrity is important. So as one example, you learned about link state routing uh, a couple weeks ago, Keshav talked about this. So you guys should know about things like OSPF and IS, IS and so on. So what happens in link state router link state routing is that the routers broadcast their routes to all the other routers, right? And so we have this, this situation where this router is advertising paths or saying I can reach this destination. And so we could have a situation where we have an attacker where Trudy comes in and she disseminates false information. Let, let me just number these. She says to router three here, hey, I'm actually router one, and you should send all your traffic destined for router one, you should send it to me. And then she can go off and get all this traffic and do whatever nefarious things she wants to do, and, and that's a successful attack. So in order to prevent this in a routing protocol, we need to authenticate that, hey, this message actually did come from router one, it didn't come from somebody posing to be, to be router one. And so one of the tools we're gonna to use to do this is called a cryptographic hash function. <coughs> and I hope you guys all know what a hash function is. A hash function is just a function that takes a value and maps it on to some key. And this is a many-to-one function. It's not a one-to-one -one function necessarily. So a cryptographic hash function is a hash function with an additional special property. So it's a hash function with the following property.
And that is that it's computationally infeasible. To, so it's computationally infeasible to find two different messages such that their hash keys are the same. Find two messages. Let's call them X and Y. Such that the hash of x is equal to the hash of y. So the reason this is important is because hash functions are many to one functions. So we could have the case that these map to the same value. Um, however, we want it to be, if you know what this value is, you want it to be very hard to go backwards. So it should be, last time I talked about these one-way functions, and so a, crypto, uh, a cryptographic hash function is a similar idea. That if you know the value, you shouldn't be able to go backwards and find a different message that also matches that. Um, and so these functions, I'm not gonna go into how you design these functions or anything. These are designed by mathematicians. Um, there's you know very, very deep math that goes into these things. Uh, there's you know, people who spend their whole lives studying this. Um, so in practice, we just use a couple different, different hash functions that were found by you know, smart mathematicians. So one common one is MD5. So this is widely reused uh, cryptographic hash function. It's due to Ron Rivest, the same guy, same R in RSA. And then another common cryptographic hash function is SHA-1. So you may have, may have seen these uh, acronyms before. All right, so now that we know what a cryptographic hash function is, let's look at, let's do a try and actually uh, provide message integrity. So as a first, first attempt, at providing integrity, message integrity. So our first protocol will work like this. We have that Alice has the message she wants to send. So she has M. And then she computes the hash of this. And I'm just going to assume that this, this hash function she's using is some well-designed cryptographic hash function. All right, so now she'll send an extended message to Bob. So she sends M coupled with this hash of M to Bob. Then Bob receives the message and he computes the hash of M. He's got M, so he computes hash of M. If this is equal to uh, hash of the, what he computes is equal to what was received in the message, let's just denote this by H. It's equal to H, then everything is fine. So I'll tell you guys, this does not provide message integrity. I mean, can someone tell me why? All right, so you could tamper with it along the way and change the hash. But then I guess when Bob receives it, he'll compute the hash of M and think that everything's OK. All right, so that's not a successful attack yet. You could change this. I guess you could change this to deny Bob ever sending anything through. Like if you change this, um, then the Bob would never think. Or sorry, you could deny Alice from sending anything to Bob if you always change this hash function. Okay, that's true. 
But there's, a, there's actually a worse attack that could happen here. Right, you could change m and the hash. Um, yeah, so you could change both of those and spoof a message, essentially. Uh, so here's the attack. Is that Trudy, Trudy creates a message m prime. And then she sends Bob the uh, m prime with the hash of m prime. And so Bob receives this message and he computes the hash on m prime here. He's like, okay, yeah, it matches this hash that I received. So it doesn't really authenticate anything here. We're still in the same situation where Trudy could create bogus messages and, and Bob thinks it's from Alice. And the reason why is because they don't share any secret here. We have to have some shared secret between Alice and Bob to make this work. So we need a, a secret. So how can we do that? Well, we'll, we'll create a, a secret key and we'll call it an authentication key. So we have an authentication key Let's call it S. And now, since we have the shared secret, it's pretty easy. So our protocol goes like this. So integrity protocol. <coughs> Works as follows. First, Alice, um, she again has M and she computes this time we're not going to compute just the hash of M, we're going to compute the hash of M appended with our secret. Then again we, we send it to Bob. We send the extended message, we send him the, uh, the message and the hash of our message plus the secret. So Bob receives this and he checks if uh, the hash of M plus S, recall that Bob knows S, both people know S. Bob checks if this is equal to um, what was received, again let's call this H. And if so, everything's okay. Now, this, this part, this hash of our message plus our secret, this is called a message authentication code. or uh, abbreviated as MAC. This is not the same as medium access control. So this is pretty cool actually because this does not require encryption. All right, so can someone tell me why this doesn't require encryption? All right, so here's the thing. You could still tamper with M here, all right? So you could do some sort of denial of service attack where you always tamper with M and then the hash check will always fail. So I guess you could deny them the, the message just arriving. Um, however, if you have the ability to do that, then you could also just drop packets. So even if it was encrypted, then you could still do this denial of service attack. Um, but as long as we're not worried about M being read by anyone, then this, this is, is 
provides integrity like we want because no one has access to S except for Alice and Bob, and S is required in order to check the integrity of this message. I guess, so let, let me, so the one way they could use public key crypto, and the other way, let's actually go over this, is with the digit, what's called a digital signature. You guys all know what a regular handwritten signature is, right? What, what does it do? If you sign something, what does that mean? Like if you sign a contract, and it means that you agree to it and that your signature is unique, so it can be verified that it was actually you who signed it. So dig digital signature is exactly the same thing. It attests that an entity owns something, owns something, or agrees to its contents. So it needs to have these two properties. It needs, it needs to be, one needs to be verifiable. And two, we can't forge it. It has to be non-forgeable. I mean, so it needs to have the same properties that a real life signature has. Now, I, I mean, I don't know exactly if these verifiable, yes, you can verify signatures, but uh, non-forgeable, I, I mean, I, I assume there's some people who can forge signatures really well. So we would like something better than a handwritten signature. All right, and so Bob's signature must be unique. This is just like you know the real world analogy. If if your if your signature is going to be non-forgeable and verifiable, it needs to be unique, right? Okay. So now let's suppose that we have a message that Bob wants to send, and look, let's look at how he will sign it. Okay. So we have we have that Bob needs something unique, um, and so what would be a good thing that's unique well we just talked about private key crypto and in private key crypto we had these two unique um, numbers we had p and q which were these unique primes that we generated everything else from um, so in in public key crypto that gives us a nice thing to use as a signature or, yes i'm sorry so we have public key crypto has unique private key and public key for each user. All right, so this will work really well for a digital signature then because these things are unique. So Bob's signature is then just his private key applied to the message. All right, so why, why is this a good idea? Well, if his public key is known, then uh, anyone can check his signature. So it turns out there's still one problem. And can anyone identify a, an attack that we could still make? Right, so if you can check his signature, you could copy his signature. I mean, you could at least, okay, so sort of, I don't know if this is what you meant by it, but you could announce that this is someone else's public key or someone else's yeah, public key in their signature is your signature. All right, so an attack would be that Trudy attack. Trudy announces uh, Bob's public key as her public signature.
so then she can effectively steal Bob's identity in, in this case. All right, so she might not know his private key, but by knowing his public key, then she can still, this is still enough information to effectively steal the key from him um, because it's no longer unique. All right, so these keys have to be unique and if someone else announces, hey, I have this public key, then this, this no longer works. So the way to get around that is to have someone certify, yes, this is actually Bob's key. And um, for that, this is called public key certification. So what, what public key certification does is certifies that a public key uh, is owned or belongs to a specific entity. Okay, so for public key certification, we need some third party to do this certification. So yeah, the, this public key certification is just, you know, in order to make sure this public key really does belong to Bob, then we have a certificate, uh, certification authority. I'll just abbreviate CA. So the certification authority does the following. One, it verifies um, that an entity is who it is, or who it says it is, is who it says it is. So this is uh, when you're applying for a certificate. All right, so, so let me just explain this briefly, is that if I'm applying, I would like to have a digital signature, and so I wanna apply for this, this public key certificate. So first of all, I have to apply to some certification authority, and usually these are commercial uh, products, services offered by people, and so the first thing that they're gonna do is verify that you really are who you say you are, because if they're issuing a certificate and they don't check this first, then we've lost all integrity again, right? All right, so they'll, they'll actually like, I don't know how they do this in practice, um, but potentially you have to like do mailing, use them uh, like physical mail or a bank account or something to tie your identity to what you say it is. And then once they've done that, they issue a certificate that binds your public key to your identity. All right, so one thing I didn't, I, I mentioned it, but I didn't write anything down, is that these certification authorities are typically commercial um, companies. Um, so there, there's commercial CAs that do this service, and for instance, um, Mozilla maintains a list of 36 trusted um, CAs. So if you want to have a digital signature, you have to pay some money for it. Uh, I don't think they're too expensive, but you know, you do need to pay the certification authority a little bit of money to do these two steps. All right, so let's move on now to endpoint authentication. Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. Is, is the CA the weakest link? Yeah, the CA is the weakest link. It has to be trusted, All right? I mean, if the CA is, you know, itself an attacker or, or is compromised, right? And, I mean, so these things do happen, um, but, you know, there's no way to get around it. We need some, we have to trust someone basically. <laughs> okay, so authentic endpoint authentication is the process of proving 
your identity. Now this is subtly different than message integrity because message integrity said that the message needs to be from who it says it is and it can't be tampered with. Now we're not worried about providing the integrity of messages, we're just worried about authenticating users. So you can sort of think of this, this is analogous to when you log in and your student account, you have to use your username and password and then that authenticates that you are who you say you are. And so this is what we're doing here. So it's subtly different, and it's just checking that the user is who they say they are. All right, so, and, and so one more reason why we're going to do this uh, different endpoint authentication than the message integrity is this approach for message integrity is not very scalable, right? So we, if we were going to use message integrity to also do uh, user authentication, then every single user in the world would have to have some digital signature. And so that's not particularly scalable, right? We don't want everyone to have to have a digital signature that's globally accessible. So let's, let's think about how, how to authenticate uh, a user. So let's, we're gonna go through a few different protocols and we'll find various flaws in them. So authentication, protocol 1.1, or 1.0, sorry. Let's just abbreviate that, AP 1.0. So this is a really dumb protocol, and for Alice to, to authenticate, all she says is that, hey, I'm Alice. And that's it. So we can tell someone tell me an attack on this. <laughs> Trudy says I'm Alice. <laughs> All right, so that's not going to work. We need something a, little, a lot smarter, actually. <laughs> All right, so let's do authentication protocol 2.0 now. All right, so the reason that, that the first one was so easy to break is we had nothing unique to Alice associated with it, all right? We just had her username, essentially. So we need a little more info. So let's say now here that Alice says, uh, Alice authenticates with by saying, I'm Alice. And here's my IP address. She'll just send So can someone tell me an attack for this protocol? So Trudy spoofs Alice's IP. And it's actually very easy to spoof an IP. Uh, you guys could do it yourself. You could download software to do it. Um, and the only way to check that if an IP was spoofed is that your first hop. If your first hop does not check that if you spoofed an IP or not, then no one else later on in the network will know. So in order for this authentication protocol to work, we would have to not be able to spoof any IPs, which would mean that all networks in the world would not allow that. And since we can't rely on someone else's network to you know, provide this, this sort of functionality, this is not a good protocol. All right, so let's improve it a little bit. So we have authentication protocol 3.0 now. And here, the key is, is I'm Alice. And then here's my password. Okay, so can someone tell me an attack on this protocol? Okay, one, one, one attack would be to, to brute force the password. <coughs> uh, 
Now, hopefully, Bob would notice that if you're trying like login after login after login. Um, most most servers, for instance, only give you a limited number of tries, right? Another attack would be to to sniff the traffic that's on the network. For instance, if this is over a Wi-Fi network or something. And I never said that this password was encrypted. So you can just grab the password out, all right? So sniff network traffic. And then you can just find the password. Now, I mean, I know you probably think that that's pretty stupid to not encrypt the password, and it is. However, many early internet protocols were designed this way. So you guys have all used SSH. Well, the precursor to SSH was called Telnet. And Telnet actually sent the password without any sort of password protection. And it wasn't, or sorry, it sent the password without any sort of encryption. I just sent it in plain text. And even uh, mail protocols, until very recently, also sent their passwords in plain text. So the assumption there in designing these old, old protocols was, well, one, they, they weren't really very concerned with security initially when designing the internet. And then two, they didn't think that people would be sniffing the traffic on the network. But it, you know, that's so easy to do that people do do it. So let's modify this to encrypt the password. So we have authentication protocol 3.1. Now we send, I'm Alice. And we send the encrypted password. All right, so can someone tell me an attack on this protocol? Right, so we have Alice here is sending this message, Trudy's listening, and so then it goes to Bob. She can guess at the context and then be able to extract, like memorize this message. So she has some sort of tape recorder, she records the message. and then does what's called a playback attack. So she might, she doesn't necessarily have to decrypt this password in order to still compromise the system. Because she has the encrypted version, if she knows what the encrypted thing is, then she can authenticate with Bob. So we need to improve this slightly. We're getting closer, but there's still that weakness of the, the playback attack. Let's look at our authentication protocol 4.0, the one that will finally work. So here, this playback attack worked because uh, Bob couldn't distinguish whether it was Alice's original message or a playback of that message. So we need to add some sort of state to, to our key here to indicate that this is a lively, um, lively uh, authentication attempt. All right, so she's now encrypted this key using a shared secret key between Alice and Bob. And then finally, Bob decrypts, oh, sorry, she sends, uh, sends the encrypted mess, the encrypted, uh, R to Bob. And then Bob decrypts the message. If, uh, if the message equals K, then it's Alice. Okay, so again, you see that we need some sort of shared secret between Alice and Bob. Now they can set this up once. So typically the way that this is done in practice is your first login, the secret key is set up, 
and then you two know the, the secret key, and so then you use it from then on. Okay, so let's talk just a little bit about security in practice. And security is really, really hard to guarantee. Um, for one thing, there's no way to, to prove that a system is correct, or sorry, is secure. All right, so you can't prove that your system is totally secure. Um, you can maybe prove that portions of the code are secure, but typically that would be very small chunks, um, like only critical functions and so on, because it's extremely time consuming and difficult to do. So, but what you can show is that known attacks don't work. You can show that. And so you essentially, if you're a security researcher and you're proposing a new you know, pr protocol to provide some security functionality, then you can go through the list of you know, all the attacks that are known in the literature and, and prove for each one, okay, this does not work on our system. This doesn't, this doesn't prove that your system is secure, but you know, it's, a, it's a good vote of confidence. Then the other way that we sort of show security, and this is the, I guess, the fundamental tenet of security, is that if no known attacks so if after, you know, so if after some long time there's no known attacks, then it should be secure. So basically, if you have a system, you deploy it, you run it for several years, and no one has hacked it, then you can be pretty sure your system's pretty secure. But you really don't know. There could be some bug that someone finds, and they find a way to exploit it. All right? And let's just go over, I guess before I do this, so, so there's this community of hackers, so people who do security are typically called hackers. Hacker used to have this negative connotation, but it's sort of now used to also describe someone who does, like, who's good at programming and so on. Uh, but there's these white hat versus black hat hackers. So black hats, these are the criminals. These are the hackers who want to do you know, nefarious things. They want to steal your bank account number and so on. White hats are security experts who try to hack things to find security holes to then fix them. All right. so. These white hat guys, uh, for instance, last time I talked about the Pentagon Tiger team, who they hacked into one of the Pentagon systems. Well, this, this Tiger team, they were Pentagon employees. So they were trying to hack their own system just to prove that it could be done and then fix those security holes. So these are the white hats. Um, and, and you know, in many cases, a black hat hacker gets arrested or something, goes to jail, and is reformed, and then becomes a white hat hacker. Um, <laughs> Because they, they want, I guess, a job after they get out of prison. <laughs> it's pretty hard to do otherwise. Um, right, so th those are sort of the, the main people in the security communities, these two, these two uh, the white hats and black hats. And the, the sort of techniques that they use to find attacks are one is vulnerability scanning. And what this does is, for instance, on a network, you go out and you probe each machine on the network and try and find open ports. So you say like, oh, are you running a web server on port 80? And you go around to every single school uh, computer in the school and you, and you ping that and you say, can I get a web uh, HTTP request fulfilled on port 80? And then if they are running a web server, there might be some known vulnerabilities to that web server. Um, so, for instance, if on your personal machine you're running Apache and you haven't done a good job of securing it, then a hacker could take advantage of that. Once they find the vulnerability, they could take advantage of that and compromise your machine. So that's one type. Another type is password cracking. Uh, this is, so these, these passwords 
are stored in, as you know encrypted strings. So if you managed to, like a few months ago, there was a hack on the PlayStation Network where they managed to get the encrypted passwords for every single user. All right, so these are encrypted, so they don't actually know the passwords. However, you can do this cracking attack where you try the brute force combinations to actually find out what are the, the passwords. And there was a lot of analysis of that done, actually, that's pretty interesting. Like, they found the most common password is just password one, things like this. Um, most people, there's actually not much randomness in the way that people uh, create passwords. They're either English words or English words with a few, like, numbers after them or an English word with a number and then another English word. Something like 90% of the passwords um, in this PlayStation data set were, were of that form, or pretty easily guessable form. So then another attack is packet sniffing, uh, or another way to find it, vulnerabilities is packet sniffing. So we talked about that, how that, that could be used um, to find vulnerabilities in authentication. Uh, another is a spoofing attack. This is where you pretend to be someone else, as we talked about. Um, another common way to find vulnerabilities is uh, using a thing called a root kit. Uh, I don't really want to go into the details about that. So one of the most common ways, though, of hacking something is social engineering. And this is what uh, the, the idea of get someone drunk so you can get their password. Ah, this is just social engineering. Or like last time I talked about the Pentagon Tiger team, they just faked some a letter from the company uh, that they bought the server from. They faked that letter and were able to get humans to do the work for them. So humans are typically the weak link in security. And then there's other ways you can use Trojan horses. Uh, which are applications that sort of s seem good, but then have an attack hit in them. Uh, viruses, I'm sure you guys are familiar with, worms. And then one other thing that I, someone brought up today is also a key logger. So if you can compromise someone's machine, then you can install a key logger and get all their passwords and all their information. So.